Welcome to How to Find More Direct Clients Than You Can Poke a Stick At podcast, a mix of both solo episodes and expert interviews. Our ideal listener is an early career, ambitious, and passionate online language services provider. She is committed to professional growth and achieving success in the fiercely competitive translation and interpreting industry. She balances multiple responsibilities with resourcefulness, values mentorship, is open to learning, and investing in her professional development journey. She embraces technology and seeks to optimize workflow, eager to connect with like-minded peers and build out her professional network. She is determined to overcome challenges and become a sought-after freelance translator. And here's your host, medical translator and translator business mentor, Jason Willis Lee. So, welcome to How to Find More Direct Clients, a podcast hosted by myself, Jason Willis Lee, the show that makes digital marketing easier and more fun using the perfect combination and just the right dose of business strategy and tech. I'm your host, Jason Willis Lee, digital marketing specialist. And today I'm so thrilled to welcome Damien Schurz from Macre- Macpreneur. He has bags of experience in Macpreneurship and entrepreneurship, and he brings a very unique perspective to this discussion. Uh, Damien, welcome to the show. I'm so happy you accepted the invitation. How are you today? Uh, I'm very well. Thank you for having me, Jason. Great to have you. Uh, Could you just share a bit as an introduction, your journey in Macpreneurship and your vision for the future of your industry? Could you just give us some general brushstrokes about what you do? Mm -hmm. So I've been using Mac since 2007, but at the time I was still working for a Fortune 500 company, American company. We were on Windows PCs. And I had this itch of starting my own business. And so in 2013, I started my company and that was all about Apple training and consulting services. I was lucky that I could work part-time, so I still had uh, my salary or a fraction of my salary to launch the business. And uh, yeah, I've been a solopreneur since 2013, and I'm full-time entrepreneur since uh, September 2016. So as a, as a solo Macpreneur who uses Mac technology, you're obviously very knowledgeable, what um, what are some of the key software tools or applications that enhance your general productivity? Can you talk about what makes us inefficient using computers, not just Mac, but maybe PC and, and Linux as well, mm-hmm. other systems? Um, what makes us efficient typing too many keystrokes or just anything that decreases efficiency? How, how do we, can you give us some hacks, just two or three quick hacks to increase our productivity? Yeah, that... Um, I think there is no silver bullet in terms of application or one application or several applications. I think it's a combination of having good habits. So let's <laughs> jump back a little bit. There are three ways that we are inefficient using a computer. So sometimes, so either we do too many clicks, unnecessary clicks, right? Or we do repetitive typing. We type things that we should not. And also we lose time trying to find stuff because either we have file clutter or stuff is not well organized. We don't have good uh, file management uh, uh, yeah, um, habits. So these are the what I call the three killers of productivity. And so to uh, minimize unnecessary clicks, The first step is really to make sure that the most used applications that you have on your computer are easily accessible. So on a Mac, it would be the dock. On Windows, it would be the taskbar so that you can easily keep those applications there. But it it would still require you to move the mouse and click. So it's better than having to open the applications folder or going back there, but um, so the next step are keyboard shortcuts, right? If you are able to quickly launch applications or quickly find uh, documents with keyboard shortcuts, that's the best. And uh, so on the Mac, the, the one that everyone should know and should use 
is a spotlight, so it's command space. And the equivalent on Windows is Windows and then the letter S. And that will go in the search bar of Windows. On the Mac, uh, Spotlight can do much more than launch things. So for instance, if you want to launch an application that don't, don't use often, command space, a few, the first few letters of the application name, return, and it's launched. But you can also do currency conversions, right? So you can say 25 GBP in dollars, and it will show you the dollar amount. So we, in the background, is looking at, I don't remember now if, it, if it's a Yahoo Finances, there is a, an, an online <laughs> service that it's pulling information from. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, on top of that, if you want to go even deeper, if you want to go the automation route, on the Mac, there is, there is a tool, a built-in tool called Shortcuts, and that one is really, it's really very powerful. So you can create yourself, even without any developer's knowledge, you can create mini applications. So you could create little workflows that says, uh, to which you can attach a keyboard shortcut. So we're going back to the keyboard shortcut. You could say, let's say that I do shift control and then the letter B. When uh, As soon as I type those key combinations, it will, for instance, open a folder, mm -hmm. launch an app, position the application window on the right side of the screen, position the finder window on the left side of the screen. So we can do a lot of things with shortcuts on a Mac. And that last one you mentioned was shift control B. No, shift. so that was just an example. So ah. whenever you create shortcuts automation workflows, mm -hmm. you can define whichever keyboard shortcut you want. Okay, got it. Right, so, you did, and, and so you can do that to launch a shortcuts automation. Uh, another way to automate stuff, and that's also um, cross-platform Windows and Mac, is by using a hardware device called the Elgato Stream Deck. Uh, do you know that uh, device? I think Jason? you've told me about this before. Elgato Stream Deck you've mentioned before, but mm -hmm. uh, please elaborate a little for our audience, for our yeah, audience's so, benefit. So it's a device that, ha that has different configurations. So there are small, smaller device with just uh, six keys, if I remember correctly. Then there, mm -hmm. are, there is a 15 key device and I have the 32. So it's four rows of eight buttons. Each button is programmable and you're not limited to actually 32 actions because you can create different panels. And so each button, physical button, can be used to either launch an application or it can be used to open a folder, to open a website. But the nice thing is that it can also, uh, you can trigger keyboard shortcuts and you can launch these shortcuts automation workflow as well uh, from the the push of a button. I'm going to ask you about cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a big um, hot topic now. Previously, mm -hmm. uh, freelance translators see a lot of confidential documents. I'm thinking medical translators on on patient reports. I'm thinking legal translators. How do you personally, as a Mac expert, uh, leverage security features and third party tools? to make sure your client's data are confidential. Are these tools built into the Mac or are there third-party tools that you integrate with the Mac? What's the, what are best practices for our audience on, on privacy, on cybersecurity? So I would say that uh, contrary to popular belief, the Mac is not immune to security threats. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. But the reason why I believe that the Mac is still better on that front than a Windows PC is, is not that inherently it's better. It's actually, it's the fact that it's easier to secure. So it's more securable. So it's not more secured. I would say more securable than a Windows PC. And also, let's be honest, there are so many more 
Windows PC out there that it's a bigger target, right? So a lot of uh, hackers and, and bad guys, they will go where 90% of the people are, yes. uh, are working. So, so, but having said that, the Mac for me is still easier to secure. So first of all, Apple has a little bit of malware protection, but it's very limited. So that's why I recommend to all my clients and I installed on all my current computers, a uh, anti-malware. So the one that I like is Sophos. It starts uh, free, but you have a paid version. Mm -hmm. And it's very low key in terms of, it doesn't use a lot of resources. And what I like about Sophos, and it doesn't matter which tool you use, what I like about the Sophos is the uh, configuration panel is on the web. So that means that it cannot be subverted from anything that would be installed on my device, right? Mm -hmm. So everything is configured through a web portal, not through the application itself. And Sophos is a third-party tool or is that part of Apple? No, no, it's a it's a third party tool. Third party tool. Yeah, mm -hmm. freemium freemium model. So there is a free plan where you can con uh, protect three devices, and if you want more devices and more protection, then it's a paid plan. And among all the malware suites that I have looked at, it's one of the most cost effective. In the if you look at how much it would cost to uh, protect up to ten devices, mm. now. That's only part of the equation. It's just making sure that nothing nasty gets installed on the computer. But there are, when, when we talk about privacy, data privacy, and protecting the privacy of our clients' uh, information, the first line of defense is to make sure that the internal hard drive is encrypted, which very few people know that it's even possible and it's not necessarily activated by default. So with the latest version of Mac OS, now it is whenever we set up a new Mac, uh, it will uh, tell us or ask us, look, let's activate something called its file vault, the technology in, uh, in Mac OS. Yeah. And file vault makes sure that if somebody steals your laptop, they can't look at the data on the hard drive. Everything is encrypted. Mm. And it's possible with Windows as well, but usually you need to have the Pro version. So Windows 10 Pro or Windows 11 Pro to have that additional uh, data encryption uh, on, the, on the internal hard drive. How do you get seamless collaboration between Mac people, people who use Mac, and maybe clients or colleagues who are on. So I'm just thinking about my audience. I'm guessing about two thirds of my audience are probably PC users. I, I just that's just a guesstimate mm -hmm. because I don't quiz my audience on PC Mac. I think I did a, an Instagram poll just for fun a few months ago, but um, it's not something I I look at because it's not uh, it's not a problem I I try and solve. But how, if I use Mac regularly, how would I inter seamlessly integrate my workflows with Linux users or Windows users? Are there ways that can make that collaboration easier? Because I, I have this belief, maybe a limiting belief, that we all have to be using the same operating system. As I'm sure that's not the case. Um, I've heard of parallels where you can switch from Windows to the Linux, how how does that uh, collaboration? How can you make that easier as a as a Mac Mac printer specialist? How how can you integrate the different operating systems between Mac users and non Mac users? So at uh, currently the the issue is not necessarily the operating system; it's more the the format of the documents, right? So if you use like Microsoft Office formats for your documents, then it's okay as long as Microsoft Office is installed on, on both platforms. The, the capability of the tool 
is different. So on a, on the Mac side, we can do less with Excel and less with Word than on the Windows version of the tool, but you can create a document with Microsoft Word on a Mac, it will open properly on Windows and vice versa. The only thing would be that if somebody who is using Windows and who is using the, Word, the, the Windows version of Microsoft Word and using advanced features that are not available on the Mac side, so for the Mac version, the, the Mac version of Microsoft Word, then the other person will not be able to do some modifications, right? So it's at the more at the document level mm. that I would anticipate potential problems. From from my side, when we talk about collaboration, there's something as well sharing documents. Nowadays, whether you use Microsoft 365 or Google Workspace or Dropbox, it doesn't matter, right? You you share a document. The person, the other person receives a link. If, even if the other person doesn't have an account, they still can download the document at the very least. And if they want, if you want to collaborate online, then as long as the other party has uh, an account with the service, I think the web has improved a lot the situation. So it's it's not as before where it was much more compact compartmentalized or nowadays it's much, much easier, I would say. Are there any AI tools specifically for Mac? Can you recommend any AI such a, an Armageddon topic now? Are there any specific <laughs> tools that, uh, that's a good way of describing it, Armageddon topic. Are there any <laughs> tools that you recommend for Mac users that would uh, incorporate AI into workflows and make work uh, easier or more productive, more efficient? Any specific yeah, the, Mac AI tools? Yes, yes. And and I would say on that front as well, the Mac, as Mac users, we have much more choice and there are many more applications, mm. native applications that are available for us Mac users. What few people know, and I um, season, season three of the Mac Pono podcast was all about artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And it, it ended at the beginning of 2024. And one of the episodes was the, the reasons why Apple is actually not behind, but it's what very few people under, know is that since the first Apple Silicon based Macintoshes, so the Macs that were like the MacBook Air with the M1 chip, that was the first one, those Macs, they have a neural engine, which is a, a small chip just dedicated for processing artificial intelligence requests, if you want. I'm simplifying a lot here, right? I don't go into details, but basically what on the PC side requires to have a very specialized um, uh, graphics card, which very few PCs have mm. on the Mac, Every Mac that has been sold since the MacBook Air M1 have this neural engine chip. So we can run locally uh, artificial intelligence uh, tools and models. We can download models on the Mac and we can make them run locally. So that's, I would say, half of the equation, right? Half of the equation is we are able to run artificial intelligence. And, and here I will be more specific, I will say, large language models, mm -hmm. right? So the equivalent of ChatGPT, yep. there is uh, another tool that can help us run uh, actually models locally on the Mac. It's called Olama, O-L-L-M-A. Mm -hmm. And that tool allows to run open source large language models locally on the Mac. So that's Half of the equation. Half of the equation is so I I use Olama and I'm able to run models locally, privately. There are uh, other AI tools more on the uh, image generation side. And I need to go quickly home in my applications folder mm -hmm. uh, to find the those. Yeah, diff, it's called Diffusion B. Diffusion B. Diffusion B. Okay. Uh, like the the animal, the bee. The, yes. Yeah. Uh, just, and, okay, got it. <laughs> yes. And so Diffusion B 
is a tool that can run locally a stable diffusion, which is a model to generate images. Uh, and that runs locally on the Mac as well. So that's mm -hmm. half of the, the battle. The other half of the battle is a tool that is called, uh, and I have two tools that I really use that have, that are now part of my workflow. The first one is called MacGPT. And that tool is actually a two-in-one. <laughs> the, the first part of MacGPT is that it's a wrapper around the ChatGPT service. So if you have a ChatGPT account, whether it's a free one or a paid one, I have a ChatGPT Plus subscription, you can log in and rather than open a browser and then navigate to chat.openai.com and, and have and have many maybe many tabs open all the time. No, I have a dedicated app and I, I just open that app and I'm in ChatGPT. But on top of that, that application, if we have what is called an, an, an account that allows us to have access to the API, so API is application programming interface, it's the ability to invoke the model behind ChatGPT directly on OpenAI's server without the user interface, right? If you go to chat.openai.com, you have to type your prompts, mm. press enter, you see the result, and then you have to maybe copy paste or select, or you have to do a lot of manual work. Yeah, But you can actually talk with the model without these, uh, these copy paste and stuff and that's using uh, for that if people are interested they need to go to another uh, urls platform.openai.com that will uh, from there you can create an account a free account you will need to pay for credits because every time you invoke the model it costs a little bit of money so you have to pay uh, to prepay some credits and then mac gpt uh, so, so I'm going back. So I have an account at platform.openai.com. Okay. I have bought credits. And now the next step, and you only do that once, it's I create what is called an API key. It's a secret key, very long with uh, uh, digits and letters, yes. something I've that's seen really... this in my, my CRM, yes. Exactly. So it's, it's, a, it's a API secret key. Yep that you copy from platform.openai.com and you mm -hmm. paste in MacGPT. And now from my Mac, I can directly talk to the model without going through the interface. Mm. And with the, the same API key, I'm using another tool called uh, Writer's Brew and that tool is also a Mac only tool. Right. So, and, so you'll give us the links to these resources. For the yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and writer's brew, same thing, uh, in the sense that you need an, an API key. So it talks directly in the backend with the model, with the mm. chat GPT model. Mm. But on top of that, in, in writer's brew, it has predefined prompts. So, it offers a library of predefined prompts, mm -hmm. like summarize, give me the, the, the eight takeaways of, of a text, expand, give me the mood, a bunch of, um, like from the text that uh, we can copy paste, um, create, for instance, a, a, a small uh, social media post. Mm -hmm. And we can choose, there are predefined uh, like for LinkedIn, for Instagram. Yep. And it knows, well, it uses the, the large language model to craft something that is supposedly optimized for those uh, platforms. It's interesting you said there are more AI options for Mac than PC. I'm wondering if half the audience are going to convert to Mac after this uh after yeah. this episode so what one question about uh the, the trajectory of apple I, i'm sure there are some apple fans out there people are using mac it's probably because they're apple fans 
They're very nice mm -hmm. products, very aesthetic products. I was wondering if you could talk about, uh, just briefly, about the transformation of the company going from when Steve Jobs was the founder. He was a visionary. Obviously, he came on stage with these just incredibly thin MacBook Air that you could put in an envelope, and he just loped around in his jeans and trainers. And he was a visionary and um, quite volatile, I, I understand. And the other CEO is Tim Cook, who is very conservative and just seems very reliable. I would consider him a steady pair of hands. How has the company, sort of in your opinion, from your perspective, changed or transformed since from the time of Steve Jobs? And obviously, he's no longer with us, sadly. Uh, and and Tim Cook. So, how how does how does the founder? I suppose I'm asking, how does the founder infuse? his values into the company is it all was it much more visionary when jobs was at the helm or before he went to pixar perhaps and then came back again and you know he founded the company left came back there was a big uh, story there how how much does the founder influence the the overall direction of, of the company or how how much impact has that had on apple so it's one of the most valuable companies on mm -hmm. the planet if not the most valuable how how has that affected the company from your perspective as a mm -hmm. as a tech expert, someone in the industry? Yeah, so when when Steve Jobs uh, passed away, I was a bit uh, skeptical or dubious about okay, will Apple be able to innovate mm. uh, with him not there anymore? And in the end, I must say that I'm not disappointed by by Tim Cook. Um, and something that um, we tend to forget, and I forgot as well at the time, is that Steve Jobs, when he came back, he hired somebody, I don't remember whom, but he hired somebody to create something called the Apple University. Mm -hmm. And what he did, and I think what was the, the, the clever move from Steve Jobs was to say, okay, Let's document the way that we work. And if you look at other large companies, Apple is a bit special. They, they have a different kind of structure, um, organizational structure. And somehow they, they are able to infuse innovation in their processes. And so... I think at this point, it's pure inertia. As long as they stick to their processes, because that's what Steve has done, right? With Apple University, mm. they have formalized their innovation process. And as long as they continue following it, I I don't see... The, the only threat that I see, and it's very palpable at, the, at, uh, at this time in Apple's history is governments looking at Apple and wondering whether there are some monopolistic behaviors, mm -hmm. right? Anti-competitive behaviors. Yep. And and for me, and it's funny because when I started EasyTech, I I made a, a SWOT, so strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and threats yeah. about me deciding that I would only do Apple stuff, right? Mm. In the threat quadrant, I had put Apple does something <laughs> that tarnishes its reputation so much that no one wants to buy Apple products anymore, right? Mm. And it's still valid today. And yes, yeah, so for me, so Tim Cook was the was the person that made apple go from a i don't know um, a few hundred million a year to billions per year yeah because he, he leveraged the cap the production capacity in in china and the low cost of uh, china production system at the same at the time as well and yeah as long as they they are they are masters of their supply chain and they continue to really 
So innovation is is maybe a it's a word that we use now for a lot of things, but I think what remains at the core of Apple is that pursuit of client, not client satisfaction, but they want to to make sure that they offer products and services that fill needs. Sure. And at Absolutely. the same time that yep. people are really like, wow, the, the wow effect. They are really, they continue doing that. What I'm noticing though, is that it seems that the trend, there is a, a negative trend at the moment, and it, I would say it's a quality assurance with respect to their uh, operating system. So iOS, iPadOS, macOS. I wouldn't say that there are more and more bugs, but the thing is, because there are more and more Apple users and Apple device users, there are obviously, if if we only have maybe 2% of people who have issues, but 2% of a large number becomes a large number. Sure. Yeah. And so, yeah. So for instance, I don't know. So you're on a MacBook Air. I don't think you're on Sonoma. No. So macOS Sonoma is the latest version. Mm -hmm. Apple did something. They wanted to improve the security of macOS with Sonoma. Yep. And they changed the way macOS Sonoma deals with external hard drives that are formatted in a special format that is actually cross-platform. So there is a format called, a format called XFAT, E-X-F-A-T. If you format a hard drive in XFAT, you can plug it on a Mac, plug it into a Mac. You can read and write stuff in it. You unplug it from a Mac, you plug it in a Windows PC, you can read and write data, right? As opposed to normally on Windows, it's called uh, NTFS. And that is a Windows proprietary uh, formatting system for hard drive. And on the other side, you have APFS, which is Apple file system, which is also a proprietary way. So if a, dry, a hard drive is formatted APFS, if you want to read it and, and read and write on it from PC, you have to buy a license. You have to buy a software that has that license that allows to do that and vice versa. To be able to read and write on an um, NTFS drive, a drive formatted for Windows, you need to pay a license to do that. And for some reason, they try to improve the security of macOS, and now it broke this XFAT compatibility. So people who used to have these, people who used to have those two systems, they need a hard drive that they can plug back and forth between Windows and Mac. Now, when they plug it on the Mac, it doesn't appear or it appears after five minutes and then it disappears and they can't use that uh, hard drive anymore. And um, in the forums, right, those people who have had issues, they all were running Sonoma. And they said that when they downgraded macOS, when they went back to macOS Ventura, the, before, the, the version before, no problem. Right, same hard drive, same computer. The only change is the operating system. Let's do the final five. Let's do the final five. So in less than ten seconds, just tell me the first thing that comes into your into your head. I haven't shared these questions with Damien before. This is totally improvised. <laughs> so just give me the shortest answer you can. Otherwise, I'll cut you off and then interrupt. <laughs> uh, advance apologies for the rudeness. Um, number one, what's the weirdest thing you've experienced with AI? What's the weirdest thing you've experienced with AI? The weirdest thing that I've experienced with AI, it's... Um... Right. Yeah. yeah. Go on. I I was asked this on a on a show, and I said that it was a colleague who was programming AI to produce art related to his childhood bands, the bands that he he liked. So something something like that. Have you have you come across some someone doing something like that? Something wacky. 
something crazy. <laughs> the thing is, I'm 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 such at the edge of technology that I'm not easily. Right? You're not whatever. easily surprised. Yeah, I'm not easily surprised, and for me, yeah. So okay, keep thinking um, about that one, and then we'll move on. If you come, move on. If you Let's move answer, on. We'll come then. back to it. What's one tool or tip you can share that makes you most productive in your daily work? One tip or tool or trick or mm -hmm. hack that you can share that makes you most productive. It can be Mac or non-Mac related. Yeah, so Mac related, I think there's a the tool that I'm using. And here it is. It's called Pop Clip. Pop Pop Clip. Pop, pop clip. clip. Yeah. Okay. Pop clip. We'll I, 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 I select text with a mouse. Yeah. I have a floating panel. One of the button is ChatGPT. I click on that. It's Mac Whisper. I click on that. I type a few words and boom, it does the thing and it replaces the selected text. Okay. Pop clip. There you pop go. Clip. Okay. Myth busting. What is the biggest myth that people believe when it comes to AI and technology? Or what is the biggest myth uh, in your universe, in the Mac? Renault universe when it comes to AI and technology, a myth that people believe that isn't true. For me, the myth of AI at the moment is to think that they will to it will totally replace us. For me, that's a myth. Yes. Yeah. It's 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 a technology like electricity. And so the myth for me is yes, AI is not a tool. It's a technology and it's like electricity. And they believe it's like a robot, right? The myth is AI equal robots. No, we have robots, mm -hmm. we have AI. Yep. Once we infuse robots with AI, then we have something else. Yeah. What's the best business advice you've ever received? Or maybe you've given someone else. Best business advice. one of your mentors or someone you've given something you've given someone else the, for me the best yeah the the best business advice for me was to focus on on one thing mm -hmm. okay drill down on one thing yeah and last one of the final five this is number five you in just one word one word only one word how would you describe ai in one word revolutionary mm, that's a good one that's a good one excellent um okay so closing thoughts because actually damien and i are heading off to a session a joint session we have a, a mastermind session coming up and um any final thoughts or key takeaways you'd like to share with our audience anything talk to the mackies directly amongst our audience i have a few mac colleagues not many they are a minority I have, they're more PC users. Mm -hmm. I'm more of a PC fan myself. But any final thoughts? And tell us where we can connect with you, where we can best connect with you to find out about your work and your expertise. Give us a, give us a place, a platform where we can connect with you. So for me, final thoughts. And if if I talk, if I think about AI, it's um, we we have to remember that we are at the beginning of the tipping point mm -hmm. of the, the 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 change in curvature of the hockey stick right so if you look at the hockey stick we're yep. still at the bottom right and so most people uh yeah it, it's actually so what i think it's it's almost impossible to really know what will happen in the short term but what i what i'm sure about is that in five years from now, AI will have as much an impact on, on our daily life than electricity has had before it was around. Mm -hmm. And in good things and in bad things, yeah. right? if you remember, there were people, their job was to light uh, lamps, right, with uh, oil oil lamps in the streets before electricity right those jobs they disappeared obviously 
We'll but, get to two two big te- you've the um, you paved the way for a book recommendation. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a very good book called The Tipping Point, and I think you know point of inflection, change of the hockey curve, mm-hmm. which is business yeah. growth. Uh, audience, two and, things that um, that Damien said. Um, one second, Damien. He yeah. said that AI will not uh, replace us, so that's very important for for all of us, for me and you guys. Don't be afraid of AI. Um, and it is to be leveraged. And he also mentioned large language models, and that is uh, part of the infrastructure of Bureau Works, which is the tool that I recommend and teach in my program. So, uh, so don't forget those two things. Damien, final final thought from you, and any final comment? Any so any if if in the audience, if you recognize yourself as having a Mac, but you realize you could be more efficient running your Mac using your Mac, think about what I talked at the beginning, unnecessary clicks, repetitive typing, file clutter. If you want to know where you're at, how well you're dealing with that, I've prepared a quiz, uh, which you have done, Jason, and you can access this quiz at macpreneur.com forward slash tips, T-I-P-S. Why is it called tips? Because you get personalized tips based on your answers. So what did you take of that um, of that quiz? Jason, I took away that I have a lot of work to do on my MacBook. <laughs> I, did, I did Damien's quiz and we will put a, a link to the quiz in the show notes. Okay, so let's wrap it up for today's episode of how to find more direct clients. Uh, stay tuned for more engaging discussions in the ever evolving landscape of language and digital marketing. Until then, ne- next time, remember to upgrade and upskill in all areas where you think you can Do better, stay on your game, and I'll see you on the next episode. Bye from Damien and bye from me. Here's a fun fact about Jason. Jason loves watching Modern Family with his wife and two daughters. Thanks for tuning in to the How to Find More Direct Clients Than You Can Poke a Stick At podcast. We'll be back soon. In the meantime, why not head over to www.entrepreneurialtranslator.com to access all our tools and resources to monetize and future-proof your freelance translation business. And don't forget to hit the plus button in Apple Podcasts or iTunes, or subscribe in Spotify to be notified when new episodes drop. For regular tips and insights, business strategy, or marketing techniques straight to your inbox, please sign up at www.entrepreneurialtranslator.com.